I, I just want to say welcome. And um, before we do anything, Anne, let's just bow our heads and pray together. Father, we want to thank you for your hand upon us. We want to thank you that you are sovereign. You are powerful. You are glorious. You are mighty. You are our resurrected King and Savior. So, Father, we meet again online to worship you, but also in person, all of us here. We want to acknowledge that your presence is in our lives. So I pray, Lord, that may you help us connect with you. Father, I pray that may you be with us this morning. Lord, there are moments of anxiety, worries that sometimes creep into our lives. But if we have our eyes upon you, we can remain strong and rooted in you. So, Father, I pray that you be in our hearts, prepare our hearts this morning. Whatever we've come to and whatever we've come with this morning, may we just be willing to hear you, hear your voice. So we want to pray that you bless your word that, we, that we're going to read together and bless our time together. In your name, amen. So let's just have a little recap from last week. Peter and uh, John healed a lame uh, man. Uh, he was born crippled, so he, he, they healed them, healed him. And it drew attention. Um, it drew a lot of attention of the crowd. But Peter did not want the attention to be upon him. So what he does, he shares the gospel. And he urges the crowd to believe Jesus, the Messiah, and re to receive his forgiveness. The priests and, uh, and the religious leaders were unhappy. And, they, and, and what they did is they, they threatened Peter and John not to speak again, not to share that again. They locked them up in prison for preaching the gospel. How many of you know any friends who have been locked up because of preaching the gospel or who have faced persecution because of preaching the good news of Christ? So what happens next? Let's read from Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 31. It says, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted the voice together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father, David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set uh, themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against the anointed. For truly in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you appointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles, Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out a hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. 
This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Praise be to his name. So friends, after the threats that were leveled at them, this was Peter and John's response. Let's look at these verses that we have just read. And I've divided them into sections. First one is, who is praying? Second, when, when was it prayed? Third, who they prayed to? Fourth, what did they ask? And fifth, what happened next? So this week, we're actually seeing as a topic, the Christians sharing what they had. In verse 32, we, read they, we can find out and we can read that there was unity among them. And then they were sharing things. So I want to ask and I want to do a quiz amongst us today, this morning. So if you know the answers, just raise your hands. Those on Zoom, unfortunately, I won't be able to look at the screen in here. So I'm going to just, just look at um, the guys here in church and uh, try and seek your answers, okay? So what's the collective name for a group of foxes? Anyone? No? So the collective name for a group of foxes is charm. Okay? So what's the collective name for a group of owls? No one? Parliament. Collective name for a group of hedgehogs. Pardon? <laughs> no, it's actually prickle. Very good. Collective name for a group of tortoises. Creep. <laughs> Don't know why they've got that name. They probably creep up on, upon people. <laughs> um, collective name for a group of sharks. What happens when you look at them? Shiver. Okay, let's carry on. What's the collective name for a group of swarms of ladybugs? Loveliness. So what's the collective name for a group of Christians? Church? Any other? Friends? Fellowship? Great, okay. We've got church, we've got friends, fellowship. I've written for you, congregation, assembly, flock, a body, a family. Some terms have we used. <clears throat> but if you were to look at this passage this morning that we read, a collective name for a group of Christians would be believers, would be attenders, would be sharers, would be prayers. So these verses that we read actually tell us about the praying section of people within that, within that the section of people that we, that we read about. That's verses 22 to 23 to 31. And next week, we look into the sharing aspects of things. Friends, as you read Acts, you will soon discover something. That the early church was a praying church. One second. That the early church was a praying church. In fact, in Acts, prayer is mentioned nearly 30 times. It's very easy to hear a sermon on prayer than rather praying sometimes. Sometimes. 
There's a well-known quotation that goes, an ounce of practice is generally more worth than a ton of theory. So you can read all that you want to read, but once you practice it, it's worth more. And so many of us are quite slow to learn that. The early church was serious about praying together. So who is praying? It says verses 23 and 24, part, first part of it. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. So what did Peter and John do? When they were released from prison, they went to meet up with the rest of the church. The writer didn't say that they went to the other apostles. He says they went to their friends, literally meaning their own. So what I'm trying to say is, friends, that praying is for ordinary Christians. It's not only for the elect or for certain few that you might think. It's for us who call ourselves Christians. While I was growing up, my parents taught us to pray before we left anywhere where we, le- anywhere we went. Pray before our meals. Pray um, before going to bed. Especially pray when you wake up. Thank God for this morning. And I went with some friends on a road trip. And two of them are Christians and few weren't. But I said to all of them, look, I've been taught to pray before we go on a journey. So can I just pray for us? And I prayed. And then we all stopped for lunch. And I said, I'm going to pray for our food. And I prayed. One of my friends, I don't know whether he was being serious or just being humorous, but he asked if I was a professional prayer. Was I was a professional prayer. Just between three of us over there, a group of three Christians, They were calling me a professional prayer. Friends, the writer says they went to their friends, literally their own. If you look at the uh, gifts of spirit, you'll find out, have you noticed that there's no gift of prayer written on there? So what I want to encourage us is, for all of us, is that prayer is for everyone. It doesn't matter how old you are, whether you're three years old or whether you're eight years old. Prayer is for everyone. So when you get the opportunity, when you make the opportunity of praying, seize it. Because God wants to hear us. So when did they pray? When was it prayed? Verses 23 to 29 tell us a little bit about it. It was prayed during the period of opposition. Peter and John had been threatened. In fact, they were actually commanded by the religious leaders in verse 18, read, not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Yet, as soon as Peter and John are being released from prison, they told the other Christians about the, these threats mentioned. And the first thing that they did regarding these obstacles was they prayed. So when opposition, when difficulties come in our life, what do we do? Do we pray? Or is our first 
instinct or first reaction is, is anger or self-pity. Neither of them actually accomplish anything. We are called to be prayer warriors. We need to realize the importance of prayer. By turning to God, we, what we're doing is we're actually saying, we trust in you. We, we give this to you. I came across this article um, the other day about uh, no, Northeastern Cod, really popular in, in the U.S., But the, the demand was so much uh, that it became a problem for the shippers. How do we get this cord into the marketplace before it loses its flavor? So they tried various methods. First, the, the cord was frozen, then shipped. But that reduced much of the flavor. Second thing, they experimented with shipping the cord alive in the tanks of seawater. But surprisingly, it was worse. The cod still lost its flavor and became soft and mushy. Finally, the problem was solved. What they did, when they put the cod fish, they placed them in the tanks along with their mutual enemy, catfish. From the time the cord left the east coast, uh, east coast and reached its final destination, those cat catfish had chased the cord all over the tank. So when the cord arrived at the marketplace, they were fresh as if they were just being caught. There was no loss of flavor, nor even the texture affected. If anything, it was better. That's what I'm trying to say here. Us as Christians, we are in a tank of particular circumstances. And it can be painful to stay in the tank. But besides our situation, God has appointed, God has appointed some catfish whose job is to bring sufficient tension that keeps us alive, alert, fresh, and growing. And it's all part of God's plan to shape our character so that we are more like Jesus. That's why the catfish are in our tank. That's God's method of producing a character in our life. It was prayed. They prayed this during opposition. Are you going through opposition? So whom they prayed to, verses 24 to 28 say, it tells us, it gives us five verses to tell God who he, who he is. But only two verses to ask what they want from him. Don't miss that. Five verses to tell God who he is. Verse 24 says, They praise God for, he, in the, for the fact that he is the creator of all things. Sovereign Lord. There's a story of Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, once may, he made an elaborate um, clockwork model of the solar system. When someone remarked on uh, how clever he was to construct uh, such an amazing piece uh, of mechanism, he replied that the good Lord must be a lot more cleverer because he constructed the real thing. We need to remind ourselves of that. Who God is? What has he done for us? including answering their prayers, they also appeal to him as a creator of all. Secondly, they say in verses 27 to 28, 
They say that they remind that they got God's enemies and opponents are subject to him. There is a saying, I don't know whether you've heard this, I probably think most of you have said it, the men might seem to win the battle, but God always wins the war. There is some truth in that. God will always win. So what was asked? Verses 29 and 30 tell us about that. It says, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Notice that in verses 29 and 30, these first Christians ask God for two things in Jesus' name. That God will give them courage and that God will do miraculous things. They pray that the enemies and opponents of Jesus will, will see the signs and wonders. So verse 31 tells us, after that was prayed, what followed? It says, after they prayed, the, the, whole, the place that they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. I guess it is true to say that um, the building of the shaking of building does not happen anymore when we have our prayers together. Sometimes you even need to shake someone up while you're praying to wake them up. But of course, that's something else. This meeting, this prayer meeting that they had, the whole building shook with the power of God. They were praying. Jim Elliott, who's one of um, five missionaries who was killed while participating in, um, in an attempt to share the gospel amongst people in Ecuador. He wrote this in his journal. Forgive me for being so ordinary while claiming to know so extraordinary a God. We have an extraordinary God. And friends, at times we need to and we should expect him to do extraordinary things. Prayer has power. Years ago, um, probably eight years ago, me and Alana both were praying about starting a family. And we felt, yeah, let's... let's, let's try and start a family. And we tried for a few years. Nothing happened. So we went to the doctors. Obviously, they did some tests and bits and bobs. And their news to us was, you know, compatible. No, it can't happen. But we knew that God was saying something to us. As much as we love the young people and the children that we were serving, we felt God was saying, I want to bless you with your own. So we carried on praying. And God answered our prayers three years later. And now we've got two young ones. Prayer has got power. So if I was to ask you, what have you prayed lately? And has God answered that prayer? And can you stand and testify that? Would you be able to? Have you prayed anything specific over the last week that you can say, actually, God had answered that prayer? Or have you prayed about your situation that you are in and said to God, 
You are sovereign. Take control of this place. Take control of my life. Friends, Peter and John prayed. They proclaimed the name of God and they said, Sovereign Lord. How often do we pray like that? Sovereign Lord, Father of all, creator of the universe. I hope and I pray that we will turn our prayers to him. And we will come with expectant heart that he will hear our prayers. I hope you feel encouraged and a bit pushed to pray more. Because we are praying to an amazing Father, amazing God, an extraordinary God, who's capable of doing anything and everything. And one thing is answering our prayers. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you because you are a sovereign God who is in control. We trust in your ability and not our own. Lord, teach us to see difficulties in our lives from your perspective. Help us to focus on you and your power. Father, I just pray that may our hearts be governed by your will. We want to be like these disciples who trust you and whose eyes were fixed on you, even in those hard circumstances. So, Father, today we want to bring our own difficult situation to you. I just want us to take a minute to bring that situation to Christ now. Pray in your hearts, friends, whatever you're going through. Just pray that prayer in your heart and share that with the Lord, the situation that you are facing. Father, you know what we have prayed. You know what's in our hearts. So help us, Lord, not to fear, but to trust. Help us to trust you in this situation that we have shared. We acknowledge that you are sovereign and you rule. So we submit to your will and your plan for us. We lean on you. We trust on you, Lord. So may everyone, our leaders, our frontline workers, the sick, the frail, the elderly, all those who are hit by this crisis, those who have lost their jobs, those who are going to a hard time. Lord, we also remember all those who have lost their um, family, who have lost their loved ones in this earthquake in Haiti. Lord, we also want to remember the people in Afghanistan who are, who are just stuck in this, in this battle, in this war zone, where the Taliban are attacking them from all corners. Lord, we want to pray, and I just want to pray for the families who were affected in Plymouth by the shooting that happened. Lord, we also want to pray for those four who were injured um, this morning in a suspected shooting again in Camden. Lord, we pray for our world and all that's going on. We pray for Japan as well as they're hit by this devastating rain. Pray for Turkey as well, 
and stay being struck by floods, which has, which has nearly um, killed more than 40 people. Lord, we want to bring our prayers to our church and to our town as well. Pray for all those who are not well today. Pray for those who are um, recovering from the operations. Or those who are struggling as well, Lord. So we want to remember our friends, our brothers and sisters, whom we know so dearly and we love so dearly. So, Lord, we pray in faith that, Lord, your grace and your help will be with everyone in this time. And we want to thank you. We want to thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. Because you are a prayer answering God. So we pray all this, all of this in, in your mighty and holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And let's say the grace to another. With the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. May God bless you all and may God keep you safe. Amen.